Thank you very much for joining us. I think we have a pretty exciting panel here. And as Thomas King mentioned earlier, um, it's very exciting times for not only plant-based meats, but also cell-based meats. Um, so we'll jump right uh, in, and we'll start with introductions. Um, Kai, do you want to go ahead? Sorry, need to reach for the mic. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai. I'm from Shook Meats. We are based in Singapore, and we work uh, on cell-based crustaceans, starting with shrimp and going on to crab and lobster. We're a year old now and really happy to be here in Melbourne to share our story with you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Nick Hazel. Um, I'm CEO of V2 Foods. Uh, we're a startup as well, uh, slightly younger than you. Um, my background's um, R&D for major multinationals like uh, PepsiCo and Master Foods. Um, this is my first startup. And what we're doing is plant-based um, meat. Um, we're focused on sustainability. We're trying to get to a, a, a product which is uh, as tasty or tastier than meat, but is affordable and sustainable. Um, and we set up this company together with uh, uh, research partners of CSIRO um, and some investors. So we're, uh, we're going extremely fast and we will be very visible to you in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, hi, my name's Tim. I'm the co-founder of a company called Vow. Um, we are another cell-based company, um, first cell-based company here doing products in Australia. Um, uh, my background's in human-centered design. Before that, I uh, had startups in blockchain and the music industry and now turning to biotechnology um, and kind of a sustainable food future. Great, so we're gonna, we're gonna kick things off with a quote that for a long time it seemed like every pitch from a cultured meat company or a cell-based meat company started the, with this quote as the first slide. Uh, it's from Winston Churchill from a 1932 paper in Popular Mechanics um, entitled 50 Years Hence. And, and in this, the, the, the quote of interest is that we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or the wing uh, instead by just growing the parts separately. And maybe it's a little bit more than 50 years uh, since the publication in 1932, but we're definitely getting closer to, to making that a reality. And so before we jump in, we're going to kind of do a little bit of a deep dive on plant-based versus cell-based. And so you've heard cell-based meat. We've, we've seen a little bit about cell-based meat discussed in the panels earlier. Um, but I'll direct this to Tim and Kai. Give us a, a quick rundown of how cell-based meat is produced. I guess I can start. Um, so cell-based meat is, in essence, what we're doing is we're providing nutrients directly to animal cells instead of growing food and feeding that to animals and that being the nutrition that, uh, that creates basically the meat um, that we know today. So what we're doing is isolating a specific stem cell type from an animal and that might be muscle or fat or connective tissue. Uh, we're putting it in an environment in a nutritional kind of uh, liquid or media that convinces it to create more of itself. So it's a neutral cell and it decides to become more of itself. Um, so proliferating is what we call that. And then we basically activate what's called differentiation, which is really just a command through a different nutrition rich media to these neutral cells to say, okay, it's time to become your designated cell. It might be muscle or it might be connective tissue or, or fat. Um, that in essence is, uh, is what cell ag is, unless you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, most of it is that's basically the technology. What makes Tim's company and mine as different is what animal species you work from. And that changes a little bit of the entire process. Where you source of it for seafood, you have to take the live source for me, shrimp, crab, and lobster. For Tim, kangaroo, and pork for now. And then whatever else he's going to work on. Really exciting. So we need a live source. You can't take it from a dead animal. So we can't be doing you know, extinct animals at this point. But maybe technology will grow. Um, so basically, you need to start with a live source. And then when we grow lots and lots of these stem cells, because its innate property is to keep dividing and it can keep producing itself. It's kind of like a magic tree. It keeps growing if you feed it in the right conditions. And then how we do that in a factory will look like breweries. They're going to be huge tanks. And then that's where we grow our cells, feed it with the right liquid nutrients, basically like a protein shake. You know, when we don't eat 
you know, the fillets or meats is actually all in liquid form. All the nutrients you need in a liquid form for them. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. And I guess to me, it's kind of like an IVF baby. It's still a real baby. It's just because we grew it in a different outside of the body doesn't make it not a real baby. So we're growing you real meat just that now, only the pots we want. So for like, you know, meats, we don't need to think about bones. I don't need to pick off my bones anymore. Um, I don't need to deal with the innate, the internal organs that I don't eat. And for sh shellfish, we don't need to peel off the shells anymore. And I l really like that because it's kind of a pain sometimes cracking the shells for me. So that's basically that. Yeah, and another really great way to think of it is, is cultivating meat is like cultivating plants. You can take a clipping from a plant, put it in a nutrition-rich media, which is essentially soil, and then it will continue to grow more of itself and more of itself and more of itself. It's no different. We're just doing it with animal cells. So on the topic of cell-based meat, one question that comes up a lot is, you know, what is the output? What does it look like? You know, in the case of a plant, we might see another plant sprouting out, right? But in the case of, let's say, based off the quote, a, a breast or a wing, that's not the output. It doesn't look like a breast, it doesn't look like a wing. So maybe you can, Kai, tell us a little bit about what that looks like for uh, shrimp and different types of seafood uh, or, or what you guys are doing, Tim, at Val. Yeah, so the first product you get directly from these brewing tanks is basically liquid minced meat. Um, and then you have to separate it from the liquid. So what you get is ready-made minced meat. I don't need to deshell it. I don't need to chop it up. It's all ready for you as a mince. But that's great as a you know home chef or if you want to cook it, you can put it into all sorts of things. So you see people doing sausages, hamburger patties. For us, we did dumplings and you could put in noodles and rice. But you know that's not the high-end product for it. To get to the 3D shape and the texture, you know, for like crustaceans, we talk a lot about texture. Does it have the springiness? Does it look like the C shape? How do we get there? So for us, it's going to be a long-term project. We work with tissue engineers, um, try to give it a scaffold for it to grow into, give it some texture. Some food science might go into it. Um, the people who already um, work on surimi, which is basically making white fish into fake crab meat, but obviously we don't want to go there. We want to give you the actual texture with as little food science as we can, but honestly, all the food you get as processed in the supermarket is all filled with food science and technology. And as all technology, it, it's a tool, it's a double-edged sword. It depends what you use for it. It could be really good, it could be bad. It just depends how you use it. So that's for us, the mince meat we start with. Yeah, look, we're much the same in these early stages. Uh, what we've done is we've produced two products. One's a, a pork ragu, which again is like a mince, and then the other one was a kangaroo dumpling, uh, kind of a nod to, to the Australian market. But this is, these are the early products, and so they're more amorphous, they're more mince-like, and there are focuses around the world around three-dimensional structures. And there's some interesting challenges around that too, right? So a lot of the experiences that exist within the body are really, really hard to recreate, like getting nutrients through blood vessels, which is how we create these three-dimensional structures and the connective tissue in that. Um, but I think that the other important thing to note here is that we can create entirely new structures and textures as well. So by understanding the mechanics and the tissue engineering that applies to creating these structures, we can rebuild them from the ground up, which means that understanding how the different muscle tubes fuse together to create fibers, we could actually create entirely new mouthfeels and entirely new textures um, that go along with the way that we want to cook whatever that particular meat is. So the opportunities are not just recreating exactly what we have today, but reimagining and rethinking what structure within protein and food could look like for an optimal eating experience. Cool. And so we'll get into the, a little bit of that uh, later. Let's shift gears to plant-based. Um, let's shift gears to V2 food. So, Nick, from a process standpoint, um, uh, take us through what your team is doing uh, to get to these really next-gen proteins. Yeah, so um, plant-based um, is a different, different way of achieving a, a, a similar, similar goal. Um, uh, you always start with a, a, a proteinaceous source, a plant source. So normally that's going to be a legume of some sort. Um, um, and what tends to happen is that there's an, a protein extraction pro process that happens where you, you essentially take the, the protein and some of the fiber from the, from the plant 
and then you convert that into a structure, which is something which is going to be uh, a different structure, whether you're going to do a, a steak or whether you're going to do mince, but you need to create a structure which gives you the bite and the mouthfeel of, of meat. Uh, very important to have uh, legumes that, um, and protein extract that doesn't taste very much because everybody knows that if you have something that starts tasting like a pea, you're not going to get rid of that taste. So it's got to taste very, very clean. Um, and then what you do is you, you cook this in, in probably the, 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 the food engineering equivalent of a thermomix to create a, to create a structure. And that's your basic structure. And I think all, most plant-based firms around the world are doing something, something similar. Um, and then what you do is you, is you combine that with some binders and, uh, and some functional, functional um, ingredients which make it perform the same way as meat in the pan or in the, in the grill. Um, you put in some fats, and that might be uh, sunflower oil or canola oil and perhaps some, some coconut fat, for example. Um, and then you have a flavor system. And that, that'll vary depending on, on, on who you're talking to. Um, if it's impossible, there'll be heme and some other, um, some other uh, flavors in there. Um, Beyond have a different approach. Um, some fed will have a different approach um, in terms of getting the flavors. Um, and then what happens is that gets combined into a meat. Now, if that's a, a burger patty, which is what we're making to begin with, um, that'll basically go into a, a standard um, piece of equipment, which is exactly the same piece of equipment that used to make meat patties. And essentially, from our perspective, because uh, we believe that it's a, a good thing to, to work with the meat industry here, um, goes through their supply chain, exactly the same process, and actually, in, in our case, gets cooked in exactly the same way as a, as a, as a meat patty. Um, the trick is, is um, we're not trying to create meat. We're not trying to create the same cell structure. We, plant protein has a different structure than meat protein. But what we need is, is for when you cook it, and when it goes into your pan, or when the restaurant cooks it, that it behaves in the same way. Because you can't unlearn all your cooking habits. You know, we only know how to cook a few dishes anyway. We can do three things with mince, and that's about it. Um, we don't want you to have to um, unlearn those cooking habits. So the trick is, is to make it behave in exactly the same way as meat. And if you can get uh, it to taste better and for the cost to be the same, then it's an open door, I think, for adoption. So for cell-based meat, we discussed like the shape of it is, is more for mince. For plant-based, do we see anything beyond that right now? Yeah, there's, there's different, different things you can do. I think it's easier to do mince. But it's kind of, a lot of people sort of say, say to me, well, great, when are you going to do a steak? And I'm thinking, well, why would I do a steak? You know, I love steak, and I would want to eat a proper steak with all of the attributes of a steak. And, and meat is not um, homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. There's a lot of things going on in meat. You know, there's some, there's some great things. There's some, there's some gristle in there. There's fat. There's one little, one cut of meat is different from the next. And, and people ask me the question, well, you know, uh, how do you make meat? Well, it's like saying there's a thousand different types of meat. And a lot of it is, is in the structure. So it is technically possible to create those sort of fibrous structures. And the technologies have been around for, for, for many, many years. Um, but equally, most meat is actually um, eaten in the form of some form of mince or sausage. So the, the bulk of the, the volume is in actually in those areas. So I think that's where that's the right place to start. And maybe sometime down the track, we'll look at uh, figuring out how to do a steak. We're talking about fats, we're talking about protein-rich ingredients, we're talking about muscle tissue. Costs right now for cell-based meat are high, um, and then costs for plant-based meats are getting reduced as the process is refined. Um, as we look at cell-based meat specifically, um, will those first products be, what, or I guess, what percentage of those first products will be this cultured meat, this cell-based meat? Uh, and will plant-based meats potentially be mixed in with those cultured meats? Is, is that part of the process? And, and this is really directed towards everyone. Yeah. I guess for shook meats, the first product we'll release, hopefully by end of next year and start of 2021, is a mince product. So we will not be releasing directly to consumers because in Singapore, the food regulations have advised us it's best to work through restaurants. So kind of like what Impossible does. You first launch of the restaurant and the chefs can control the food safety of it. So you're not dependent on your home cooks 
and worry about, well, is it not safe because you didn't cook it properly? Um, so it would be a mince product, and we're also looking to work with seafood distributors and packers to see you know, how they want to distribute it, but um, mostly through restaurants first. And then hybrid is how we did our um, first showcase of our dumpling as well. So it's a siumai, which is a pork and a shrimp mix. So we used the corn product, which is a microprotein, as the pork substitute and our shrimp cells as the shrimp component. So I think there is a huge market for hybrid products when cell base really gets into the like grocery stores and I hope you know the chefs we work with will be putting our shrimp with plant-based products instead of you know traditional meats because to me that kind of defeats the whole purpose I mean you can reduce it with mixing it with traditional meats but I think you know the idea is to have a clean sustainable way of eating and we should have a blend of that. So meat eaters get a bit of meat, but then you can have the plant base to do the most of the bulk where the cost is a lot cheaper now. So that's kind of my take on it for now. I mean, until we get our final product into the commercialization step, I don't really know what is the final product going to look like, but that's the area we're looking towards. Yeah, I mean, I mean we're, we've got a very, very similar early go-to-market. It's, it's top chefs and... The reason being is that these are trendsetters as well. These people bring with them a brand, they bring with them a distribution network, and so it removes a lot of those unnecessary uh, early struggles from that supply chain um, for us as well. But more than that, so we're very similar. We, we've done the kangaroo, we've done the pork, but we don't expect those to be our first products. Um, pork was easy. It's, the, it's got the most literature out there in terms of cellular agriculture. I say easy. It's extremely difficult, but it's the most easy of uh, the animals at the moment. Uh, kangaroo was one because we were talking about something different in kangaroo. So kangaroo is the first time someone's used a non-domesticated animal and produced a food out of it using this technology. And so that was really, really important for us to prove and, and to have that milestone. But these first products are going to be with chefs. And we haven't decided exactly what those are yet because we're actually going to be co-developing those with chefs, including the animal source that, that comes from. And for us, that might not necessarily be beef or chicken or duck. It might be something entirely new and experience that you've never necessarily had um, from an animal source we've never thought to potentially eat like that way before. Uh, when, when I started this, 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 um, this adventure, um, I did look at cell-based versus plant-based in terms of what was the way we were going to deliver, del deliver this outcome. And, and clearly, they're on, a different, they're on a different innovation curve at the moment. Um, plant-based, it is possible. Um, it's absolutely possible to have something which tastes great and could be uh, priced the same as meat. Um, certainly long term, there's, there should be no reason why plant-based shouldn't be cheaper than meat, actually, when you look at the, the physics of, of what's actually happening there. Um, but if you're going to get to mass market really, really quickly and to make a difference from a sustainability perspective really, really quickly, then for me, it was, a, it was, no, it was no choice for, 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 for what I'm trying to do. Um, Cell-based will have a longer development curve. Um, the end point in, in 10 years may be, may be the same, but it's going to take a long while for the, for the costs to get to a point where it's really affordable for normal people. Um, so that was, that was the decision uh, for me. And the other important thing is, again, from a sustainability perspective, because that's the thing that's really changed. Uh, um, it's not about veganism, and because all of, all of the, the cruelty to animal ar arguments have always been there. But what has changed is the realization that we actually have to get moving on sustainability issues now. And the good thing about plant-based approach is that you can start looking at the agronomics. You can start looking at sequestering carbon into the soils. And, and that's very much part of the research that we're doing with, with CSRO to understand how, do we, how can we part of a system which is actually restorative um, in the food that we eat. And, and while cell, cell base can get there as well probably in the future, um, it's our sort of job now to move really quickly now because we can make a difference quite quickly. I'm really glad you said that because so we, had, we came at it from a very different perspective but one that I think is quite complementary. So I think definitely in the short term there's the rich opportunity for sustainability in plant-based, right? different development curve. But what we're seeing is that people aren't necessarily slowing down their meat consumption globally. It's going to continue to rise. It's going to almost double by 2050. And in order for us to do that, we need to create something that people are going to be 100% happy to eat in terms of those rising macroeconomic factors. Um, and so that's why we jumped into the longer development curve because we went, okay, great. There's some fantastic entrepreneurs solving this in the short term, but we're going to hit a critical mass in 10 years where that's not going to outweigh, as far as we see it, the consumer desire for, for real meat products. And so we want to 
basically replace the way that we produce those, those products. Uh, Nick, the work that you're doing with Cyro, um, tell us how it's different than uh, some of the existing plant-based products out there. Um, well, there's a few things. I mean, the, the, the IP that we created is around the texture. How do you get something which really does give you the right texture? Because that's absolutely crucial. Um, when you're eating meat, you don't really analyze. When you're eating meat, you don't analyze it. I do. I'm trying to think, well, what is actually going on when I'm um, chewing on that burger? But to reproduce that texture is really, um, there's some IP around getting those protein structures. Um, I think the most important thing is actually um, extracting the protein from, from legumes in a way that's really, really efficient um, and owning that sort of supply chain because um, that enables you to influence what's happening in the land and to have a real sustainability story. So that, ex that protein extraction process, again, is an important part of the technology. And then the other, the other work that we're doing, obviously there's, a, there's flavor chemistry to understand what is the flavor, what drives the flavor in meat. And when you understand what actually happens in real meat in terms of the, the, the reactions that happen, I don't know whether you've noticed it, but raw meat doesn't taste the same as cooked meat. Chefs know a lot about that. They know exactly what to do to, to get all those reactions. And it's chemistry that's happening when you cook meat. Get all those reactions going to give you the real taste of meat. Well, um, Syro understand all those reactions because they've been studying it for decades. Um, and we've worked with them to understand, to reproduce that, that chemistry in our product. So actually, you end up with exactly the same flavor of meat because it's exactly the same chemistry that's going on. So those are the, those are the sorts of work streams that we're doing. There's a nutrition work stream as well. I mean, for us, it's really important that if you're going to replace meat um, for anybody, it has to have the same nutritional value. And meat is, is incredibly nutritious. There's a reason why we love meat. You know, it, we, we evolved eating cooked meat because it's incredibly nutritious. So we need to make sure that, that whatever we replace it with has to have equal nutrition. Um, and then there's another opportunity which we shouldn't miss with plant-based is, is that if you're going to be eating plants, you should have some of the nutritional benefit of plants. It seems a bit weird to sort of extract all the goodness of plants, just, just put in the protein and then have nothing good about it. So, so for us, it's important to make sure there's, there's fiber in there, that we are feeding our, our microbiome. So when you do have a burger that's made from plants, at least you, you have something which actually contributes to, the, to your nutrition from plants. So that's, the, that's what we need to do. And, and, and obviously, there's a little bit of supplementation in there to make sure that we get the, the, the same nutrition as meat. What are some challenges that affect any type of next-gen next protein and these challenges could be either technical or regulatory here in Australia and the overall Asia-Pacific region. What, what are the, the main things that your team is, is looking to overcome? Well, okay. So there's three main areas there. There's a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, there's three main areas for us. So there's the consumer acceptance side of things, um, which, is, which is a big one, um, but a, also a tricky one to understand without a product out of market. Uh, there's the technical side of things where there needs to be a lot of different innovations along that whole chain there. So, and I can probably jump into the, the different parts of that as well. And then the third one is regulation. So, working with regulation bodies who have no idea about this technology and are very, very new and very green to it, it doesn't necessarily fit into any framework that we have in regulation. <laughs> so, the question is, is how do we then approach this? Is it, do we treat it like meat? Do we treat it as something entirely new? We, we haven't built the capabilities in our, in our legislation for this just yet. So those are the three major areas of, of challenge for us. I think in plant, the, the regulation, regulatory hurdles aren't as big. I mean, if you're going to use heme, um, then there's obviously some regulatory uh, stuff in Australia around genetic modification. But in general, you don't need to do that. Um, I think there's, a, there's obviously an, a, an opportunity for us, I think, in Australia to th this whole thing about um, meat, animal-based meat versus plant meat, can it be called meat? Uh, and the sort of trench war warfare that we see emerging in, in Europe and in the US between the meat industry and, and the, the plant-based uh, meat industry, which um, it's, it's really destructive and not, not very helpful at all because there's room for both. And actually, the world needs both. Um, we're talking about an additional um, uh, meat industry on top of the one that we've got and my belief is that I mean, I'm not a vegan um, I don't believe that um, that's an appropriate way of looking at it I think we should be looking at sustainability we should look at su 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 no, sustainable meat and sustainable plants because you can have unsustainable agriculture as well um, and you can have sustainable meat so I, I think you actually have to look at it the paradigm is, is, is the wrong paradigm when you say it's vegan versus carnivores 
Um, so in Australia, I think there's a much more healthy um, opportunity that I think we can take, and that's we could triple the, the Australian meat industry if we made meat from plants. And, and that's a real great opportunity for Australia. We already have a great reputation for exporting meat around the world. Um, we could export um, uh, three, four, five times as much meat to the world if we embraced plant-based uh, meat. And I think that that's the conversation that I like having with people who are in the meat industry. And the, and the final point there is that a lot of farmers, most farmers who, who grow meat, grow other crops as well. It's the same system. It's an it's a, it's a ecosystem where you've got pasture, you've got crops, um, you've got grazing, and it all fits together in a sustainable way. And that's a really good way of looking at it. I think I'll add a little bit more on the practical side as a startup. So other than all this big picture, I mean, getting started as a startup doing an alternative protein in Singapore, and I've heard from Tim in Australia too, these are new countries which are not so familiar with alternative proteins. So just to get started, getting lab space took me several months, even though I'm a researcher and I have connections, but you can't just use academic labs to do your research. You need proper agreements to make sure IP is not conflicted. And then even later on, working together with these excellent research institutes to set up collaborations that will help move the, um, the field forward, it's difficult because even though the scientists in the startup agree on all the terms, then the IP should be decided after the technology is built. But the tech offices in Singapore, at least, have a hard time um, giving that up because that's part of their KPI or how they evaluate it for their performance bonus of the year, which actually does nothing good for the startup or the research institute at all. Um, also, funding raising, we're very lucky to have closed it pretty fast, but that was because my CEO, Sandhya, had had great connections already built up in Silicon Valley where everybody is you know, into alternative proteins, they want to be in the game, they like that we're both scientists and we're based in Asia, so that's new, and we focus on crustaceans, so that's new. So carving out a unique thing for yourself is difficult because this is a very hot topic now. Um, and also investors in general in Singapore and Asia tend to be more risk averse. So they don't really want to come in this early in the game, but you, as a biotech company, more than a food tech company, when we start, we need a lot of money. I can't just go to an accelerator like a, that only gives you $100,000 and takes 10% of your company, and that only lasts me for, you know, I can't buy any equipment. I can buy some reagents for two to three months, and how much work can I do? I can make you know, one dumpling, hopefully, if everything goes well. So that funding is hard to, and hiring, that's still a problem I'm trying to, you know, actively resolve, you know. The atmosphere for startups in Singapore is very developed for digitech or fintech, but biotech, they're very used to being incubated in academic institutes, and nobody comes out without doing, getting a patent approved, through the universities or academic institutes and then starting a company. We started from scratch. I had nothing. I had no technology. We came out and do this on our own. And all the people who talk to us from the academic institutes are like, you're crazy. Just come back. I'll give you a job. You can do it here. But if I had gone back to the research institute to do it, one year on, I would not have gotten the grant money to do it. And I wasn't an independent researcher with money I could use to start this. And, you know, it's a chicken and egg, so they want us to do it in-house. But if you wait, then where are you going to raise money? And the grant system takes too long. It is, we need to start this already. We need to be building this now. I can't be waiting for money to come in. So. Right. It takes time. It, it's Go such ahead. an important point as well, right? It's that we're, we're breaking all of the biotech rules right now. Like they're not set up, biotech has not traditionally been set up for rule breaking, fast moving startups. You know, when I wanted to buy our first reagents, which is, you know, some of our liquids that have nutritional media in there, it took me six weeks to set up an account with the largest provider of these things. I have 400,000 different products. I had to bounce through seven different departments. I'm like, please just take my money. Just take it. Just take the money. I want your things. And I'm like, ah, look, you're going to talk to Ben in accounts over there and he'll pass you on. It's crazy. And we're only just starting to see that kind of shift now because 
there's been a need for it, and and that's that's where things are moving now. But it's been it's been hard setting it up from start from the start is hard. In regards to government funding and research, uh, Nick and Tim, how does Australia um, look in terms of that type of thing for food? Yeah. I, so look, there's there's some great organisations out there. There's, there's I think it's FIAL who we've been talking to who are really behind you know putting funding behind food and food innovation. Uh, the New South Wales government has given us an, an MVP grant, which is a really good kind of kickoff for us, and really was more just to say that the New South Wales is getting behind this technology, but not not quite enough. Um, I think it's I think it's very new. Um, if I talk to anyone in the Australian kind of government or the regulation side of things, cell-based meat is not even, the conversation is just beginning now. It's just starting now. So hopefully we see some more. If any of you are out there and want to talk more about that um, and how you can support this industry, um, we're super, super open to it. I don't know if it's the same for plant-based, but. Uh, yeah, I haven't been that successful in getting uh, grants, um, but maybe that's just me. Um, uh, so, I mean, seriously, I mean, the, 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 in Australia, there's the R&D tax thing, which is really good for startups, and it, it does help in a startup world. Interestingly, I'm coming from a multinational world, R&D tax is, is not actually very useful um, in encouraging large multinationals doing R&D, which, is, you know, if you get me off this podium, I'll, I'll give you chapter and verse, which is a bugbear of mine, um, which is why there, are no, there is no sort of very little large multinationals doing R&D in Australia, which is a shame. Um, but, yeah... Uh, Funding and government support is useful. I think there is a mechanism in the R&D tax which, which helps. Um, more, is, more is useful, but certainly in plant-based, um, it's, it's perhaps not quite as crucial, and maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but because there is this wave of investment in this, in this space now, venture capital is extremely active. They can see that there's this, this trillion dollar industry that will be created, and it's just a question of who's going to be doing it. And so venture capital is extremely interested in this space. And so, so Raising money, I think, is, is for, for, for good technology and for really strong ideas. Um, there is investment money available for, for entrepreneurs who do want to have a go. So um, uh, talk to your friendly venture capital um, uh, investor, and I'm sure there's a few in the room, if you have that uh, motivation to have a crack, because the opportunity is huge, and there's going to be lots of, there's going to be lots of players. Um, it will shake out, but there will be lots of players in a trillion-dollar industry. There's going to be plenty of people having a go, and some of them are going to be successful. I'll, I'll second that point. Australian venture capital has been amazing in this space and there's huge, huge appetite for it. Yeah. So, t Tim, you mentioned move fast and break things. So we know that that's something that you're excited about. Uh, Nick, as, um, as an expert in food tech and Kai as an expert in research, do you agree with the move fast and break things mentality when it comes to food? Um, y yes, I mean... Obviously, within reason, food is uh, food is tricky. Um, it's it's actually the slowest moving thing when it comes to innovation. I mean, when I was at Master Foods, and you know, you'd be so frustrated at, at just how conservative people are with their with their dietary habits. You know, we still aspire to the same food that our grandmothers cooked us, um, and that's I think again, it's it's in our genes. You know, we 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 learn to like something. We've learned that it's safe, and I think we're programmed to basically go back to what our, our, our parents and our grandparents taught us to like. So we can't change that. That's sort of hardwired, um, hardwired into us. Um, so we have to work with that. We have to work with the fact that, that people are conservative. If I'm going to produce a piece of meat and uh, you're going to use it to cook a shepherd's pie, it bloody well better taste like a shepherd's pie because otherwise, and like the shepherd's pie that your grandmum cooked you, otherwise you're not going to, uh, you're not going to uh, like it. So we have to work within the constraints of the, of the conservatism of our consumers. Um. Kai? Yeah, I actually never put this into words, but I think, Tim, that will be my new team motto. Oh. <laughs> I think so. We have to move fast and break things in terms of research innovation. Coming from an academic background, I have not done any startups before Shug Meet, so yeah, the, I'm a newbie. Um, but research in academic world is too idealistic if you want to survive as a startup. A lot of how people do are used to doing things is that there's, they want to find the perfect way of doing it. Only when we achieve the perfect product can we release it. But as a startup, I only have funding for you know three, four years to go. I can't wait for my perfect, cheapest media to come up before I have an MVP. I have to achieve kind of like a midpoint where it's cheap enough 
it's not the final prize I want to be, but it's cheap enough. And it's not like the final C-shaped shrimp that it's going to be at the end, but I'm going to release a mint product that's affordable, not by all, but at least, you know, I can afford it. I, I don't usually eat at very expensive places, but I can afford to eat it. And that kind of matches our production scale, because I'm not at a rate to produce for the whole Singapore, and that's only six million people, not many. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense to release one that is moderately priced, not the final high-end product, but then that matches how much I can produce as well. And that creates, you know, a belief in the consumers that we can actually do it. And, you know, in terms of research, I think it's very important that you have to move fast. You're just trying things that, you know, could be really out of the box. I've heard, you know, some of my startup friends who have tried Gatorade to feed the cells. And I'm like, really? Gatorade? Oh, I guess, you know, there's some, like, ions there, some nutrients. And you have to be willing to try out of the box because if it's not out of the box, people have done it already. So, you know, why are you doing this? We're doing this because we want to create a new way of making meat and cheap enough way to do this in the with the cell-based technology and plant-based too. So move fast and break things. I like it, Tim. I, I should add something, one last thing to move fast and break things because it's move fast and break things and then fix them even faster, right? You don't just leave them broken. Um, and the, the beauty of what we're doing in biotech and, and similar with what, what we're doing in the plant-based space is you can move fast and break things and then understand that and automate the moving fast and break things so it's running by itself and giving you the insights by which you can then fix it even faster, which means the next thing that you break is a better thing to break and you're breaking in smaller breaks every single time until you're getting to something that is optimized. But the most important thing is that consumer is king. Right? We could sit in a lab for years and years and years and years and go, I've created peak beef, right? But the problem is, is that unless someone tastes that and tells you that it's peak beef, you don't know. And you could spend all this time and all this money getting to what you think is optimized, and then that whole thing's wiped out. So move fast and break things is sub-optimized, but then we allow, it's getting as fast as we can to something that we can test and then reliably go and break further. That's, that's why we do that. I'll just add something, because I kind of rambled and I forgot the question while I was rambling. Um, uh, we've gone basically from, in 10 months from, from starting, uh, to, to launching nationally. Um, I've never worked so fast in my life. I think we're on recipe number 57 now. We've been basically doing two or three iterations a week um, of our development, and it is, it's been absolutely enormous. And what's also interesting is working with CSIRO, we've been working fast as well, and, and these are not timescales that they're used to. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's an extremely exciting to go so fast. Um, it's, it's terrifying. It's extremely exciting, um, and but we have to, because it's a burning platform. We have to move fast. So, um, so it's uh, it is the way to go. And I, I I know that in my experience in multinationals, we've never moved as fast as we are as a startup. So it's uh, it's great fun. Great. We'll open it up to questions in just a second. But I I want to, and so I'm going to put you guys in the hot seat with a question of you know hybrid products, right? We have fish, sea, or excuse me, seafood, crustaceans, sea, uh, and things like fish. We have meat. We have plant-based meat. Uh, in maybe one word, and that word could be no, right? Uh, what kind of hybrid products would you like to see? And we could start with Tim. I'm going to put you on the hot seat since you, uh, since you guys work on kangaroo. Sure. Okay. One word's really hard. I've already, I've already gone over. Um, for me, hybrid products is why do we have to continue to operate on the same standards of what we're eating? So when we're looking at it from a cellular level, we've democratized the process for animals in terms of where we can source it. And what are the odds that the four animals that were easiest to productionize are actually the most delicious or the most nutritionally rich or have the best texture profiles down at a cellular level? So for hybrids for us is how can we actually understand cells without the context of where they came from to pull together and recreate things from the ground up using these new technologies for whole new food experiences. So one word. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't a no. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, for me, I think I, I just want to move away from this paradigm of, of meat and vegan and just talk about sustainable. It doesn't matter to me whether or not something's vegan or, you know, if it's cooked on a, on a broiler that contain meat. Um, it's, it's of no interest to me. You know, it's just 
sustainable. Um, and if something did contain uh, a little bit of meat, but it was sustainable, that's fine. If it's all, all vegan, that's fine. If it's all meat, it's fine. So we just need to change the paradigm. So it's not a hybrid, but I, I just, I want to focus on what's important and not on, on um, sort of arguments which are just, just irrelevant, really. One word, that's really hard. I have many one words to describe it, but I think hybrid is great. And I feel what Tim and Nick is talking about. For me, the main thing is I want the hybrid or whatever alternative product to be out there to be clean. And consumers will want to eat it. So it has to be clean, tasty, and cost-friendly. So that's three words, honestly. But yeah, I, it has to be there. For consumers like you and me, I mean, we need all sorts of insect-based, plant-based, cell-based. Because I'm not going to eat one product a day. I have at least three meals a day, and I eat different foods different products in one meal. So we need everybody and everybody to contribute to this sustainable future. Great. So let's open up to questions. Um, I believe Will is going to be reading off the app. So if you have a question, you could go ahead and submit it through the app. Otherwise, there will be a microphone um, that's coming around. So I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you. Questions from the floor. OK. Hi guys, uh, I'm Kim Berry, the editor of Food and Drink Business Magazine. I've actually spoken to Tim and Nick, so hi. Um, uh, I think, from a, looking at it from a food manufacturing sort of point of view, obviously you guys are in the zone of you're still in a lab and you're still creating and developing these things. What, what does it look like once it moves to that next next phase? Like, what does, a, what does the processing of a cell-based meat it's a, it's a really good question. So the best way to imagine it is... So I, I hate this term lab-grown meat because every food that, you, that you've had at some point has found its way into a lab for at least food testing, right? Not to mention like an Oreo. I don't know how much time that's spent in a lab, right? But this is... Right now it's in a lab. Cookies. Right? Right now it is, but the future will look like a beer brewery, right? So it's these big metal vats are currently what we're looking at. They're called bioreactors, which is a really scary name for tank, right? So that means what we're doing is liquid goes into that. Um, we seed that with cells and then that mixes it around. It's just a big stirring pot. And then out the other end of that essentially is where you get your amorphous structures or it can start to grow three-dimensional structures if you're doing co-culturing in there. But it's not scary. It's not a lab. We're not talking people in lab coats. We're talking craft brewery and small production. Um, that's what the immediate future looks like, and then just larger versions of that. And Nick, when you're looking at the plant-based um, proteins, uh, there's there's a huge push at the moment, particularly in the health and wellbeing space, for things to be clean and as natural as they are as they're coming out of the ground or grown or whatever. And so the notion of this, it's, it's plant-based, so there's these connotations of it being healthy and... Um, but then there are concerns around the processing of even healthy foods. Uh, so how do you tackle that in terms of it's a plant-based product, but it's still going through a number of processes and manufacturing and extrusion? Like, is that a, is that a sticking point or do you think consumers are not going to be particularly concerned about that? Uh, some, some consumers will be. Um, I, I always worry about the concern about processing. Uh, I know when I used to make um, pasta sauces, um, uh, the amount of processing that went into it was an awful lot less than the amount of processing when you cooked it um, in terms of the thermal process. So I was kind of thinking, well, they say, is it processed? And I go, yes. And do you cook? Well, um, so, so when you actually know what, what happens in the food industry, um, a lot of those 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 concerns melt away because actually no one in the food industry wants to overprocess something. It costs a lot of money to overprocess. You minimally process everything um, and you'll be processing an awful lot more in your kitchen in general when, you, when you're talking about processing. For this category, you do have to extract, um, you can't use the whole legume. You can't make a burger which is 100% lentils. Well, you can, but it'll be a lentil burger and it doesn't taste like meat. So it's not really serving a purpose. So you have to extract some of the protein, concentrate the protein. So there is an extraction, which means that you concentrate the process, the proteins and some of the carbohydrates and some of the fiber goes into another stream, which you don't use. Um, but that's okay. Um, for me, it's important that if you're gonna be making a meat that it reproduces the nutrition of meat, because that's what you use it for. Otherwise, you think that you're gonna get the same nutrition, you don't. Um, but smuggle in some of the nutrition of plants. 
And increasingly in the nutrition space, that means doing something that's going to feed your microbiome um, because that's, that's the reason why you um, need to eat lots of plants. Um, obviously, there's no problem in eating lots of meat. The problem with eating lots of meat is that you tend not to eat a lot of vegetables, and that's the problem. Um, so we want to help in that sense. But I, I personally have no problem with processing. Uh, um, and, and I'm, uh, but I do understand there are consumers that, that are concerned with food processing. Great. Thank you very much for that question, Nick. I'm going to go to one on the app, and what we know we've got one question there as well. Question here, would cell-based meat be the next GMO? So I'm not sure I fully understand the question, whether it would get backlash being a GMO. Is that the question? But I'll try to address it. I can tell you cell-based meat doesn't have to be a GMO. What is the GMO? GMO is genetically modified organisms. You do not need to use genetic modification for cell-based meat. That is not a requirement. It is a possibility, but it's not a requirement. And for a team and me, we're not using genetically modif genetic modification in our process. Um, for me, in terms of crustaceans, it's innately immortalized. So immor they have longer telomeres, which means they have longer lifespan. Some of the crustaceans are able to regrow their limbs when you chop them off. I don't suggest you do it, but there's been observations it's possible. So it suggests that they have better stem cell abilities compared to other seafood or other land animals. So we don't need to go into GM. I'm there has always been question, and here again, there is question about GM. I think it's a valid concern how we want to prevent from being or having backlash like GMO is to be completely transparent. We have to have the whole process to be transparent, to go through food regulations. And as a consumer, I want to know what exactly goes into my food. What is the whole process? What are you feeding them? How are you extracting it and making it into a mincemeat? So transparency and talking about it to consumers is how we're dealing with it as a topic. Um, I mean, the, the implication is, is that there's something, um, there's, there's a consumer backlash. Um, I think if we, everything, the thing about G, GM and, and any, any scientist doesn't have a problem with uh, the, the tool. It's about the misuse of a tool for a purpose that isn't actually in the interests of people and the consumer. That, that's what, that's a misuse of a technology and nobody wants to misuse technology. But the, the motives here are good. You know, we're trying to save the planet. Um, and I think it's a, it's a bigger existential problem, obviously, is that, is that in a world with 10 billion people, we can't go back to sort of um, hunter-gatherer sort of uh, situations to feed the planet. It's just not possible. So we do actually have to use some of the technology that we, that we have our, to our disposal to make us work in a planet in a sustainable way. It's just that's the reality um, because we are going to have 10 billion people. So let's use the technologies that are available to us in a really safe, sound way that preserves the planet and, uh, and, uh, and is good for our nutrition. So that's, that's a good use of technology. Great. Thanks for that, Kay and Nick. And uh, just a reminder, for those of you that have a question potentially for Alex as well, he's a wealth of knowledge, so make sure you ping him when you need to. Question from here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm an engineering student at La Trobe University. A uh, question for Tim, but also the rest of the panel as well. You mentioned uh, technical challenges in actually getting to widespread uh, cellular agriculture. Um, could you expand on those challenges and what innovations are needed to overcome them? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so there's, there's heaps. So I'll touch, on a, I'll touch on a few different areas. The first one is media. So the nutritional rich media, traditionally there's not been any need to innovate this. It's been used for life sciences, which are things like organs. When you're growing the cartilage for someone's knee, they don't mind paying $100,000 for it. Um, but people do mind paying $100,000 for a burger. So optimization of what goes into that media to move away from what we've been using in research to things that are more plant-based and more efficient and more effective, that is a major, major challenge challenge. Where the challenge exists technically for that is the number of ingredients in there means that there is a number of different factors that you can change in order to change the behavior. So on one side you want to be proliferating which means creating more cells. On another one you want cells to be effectively becoming muscle which is a whole different problem. right? And the technical challenge there is finding out exactly which ingredients in what ratio should go in there which requires widespread experimentation which becomes exponential in terms of the amount of steps you have to take so the challenge that exists there is twofold one is around the robotics that exist in that so we can remove manual labor and do those things faster 
And then the second that exists within that is when we're doing that, we need to be understanding the behavior of these cells, not just in how we see them, but in the gigabytes of data that they're creating and expressing through their biological functions. So we can do RNA and DNA sequencing to understand cells of their specific cell type and also their surface markers and how they work and how they behave. But where that becomes really difficult is this is gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of biological data. What we need to be able to do then is take that data using data science, what we call bioinformatics, bring it together and create computational models and mathematical models to understand what's the next best experiment or step in the experiment to do. So that's one major challenge is how do we apply what's traditionally been done really well in tech um, to, to biology. And then the other one is, and th there's a lot more than just these, but the other major one is in what we talked about, those tanks. So there's not been any real innovation to create 10,000 litre tanks that work at scale. They're very expensive. They've always been very expensive because a few companies have had a, had a hold on the pharmaceutical industry who have very deep pockets. So we're starting to see extremely impressive innovation in that. We saw a guy in Portugal create his own one for a fraction of the price because he wanted to study it in uni. But those are the, as far as I see it right now, two of our really, really key challenges. Yeah, I'll Kai, add be a before you, you jump in and answer, uh, you mentioned Gatorade earlier. Regarding the serum free medium, there is also a company or a, uh, a group in Japan that also tested a Japanese green Dakara, also an energy drink, and they say they have high proliferation from using that energy drink. So, with that, I'll <laughs> pass it over to Kai. Yeah, I think we're almost out of time, so I'll give you a quick one. The other one is 3D texture. How do you get the tissue engineering, hydrogels, 3D printing to get the final product? product that people are used to, like for steaks, it's really complicated. For seafood, crustaceans is a bit simpler. So that's another big problem. If you're very interested, come talk to me or Tim after this. Um, there's also very good resources. Good Food Institute is the big and Food Frontier has a lot of resources. Good Food Institute specifically has a very detailed write-up on all the technical challenges in it. And there's also a very good Reddit forum on um, cell-based meats. I forgot what is the name Eli of Elliot it. Schwartz is yes, the guy who Elliot wrote Schwartz. Yeah. Futurology. Yeah, so he's great. Very detailed, good forum, lots of conversation. So anybody who's actually interested, I mean, I think Tim and I would love to speak to you. We look for collaborators. Um, the field needs to work together, plant-based, cell-based, insect-based. It's still not there yet. We have lots of work to do. And if people don't work together, then we're not going to be able to save the world and we won't be able to eat whatever we love. And I don't want to get there, so... That's what I'll end with for now. And one last resource, and this is for you, but for everyone else as well. Um, if you Google Google Talks um, and Cultured Meat, uh, Cellular Agriculture Society have done the future facility of 2040. And you can have a look at a video of what that future facility might look like. It's, it's really impressive. Cool. That's it for time. Thank you so much. And we are preparing for our next panel, uh, which will start shortly. Thank you. <laughs>